And shall we start? Yeah. I guess we are live. Good evening, one and all. My name is Arun Kumar. I'm an executive member from AAP Andhra Pradesh. Can you just say yes if you can hear us? If you can hear me? Are you able to hear me? Dr. Komal? Yeah. Yes, we are able to hear you. Dr. Arun? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Bhavna on behalf of IAP technical team. Would like to invite our speaker, Dr. Komal Krishna, on the topic, Insights on Outcome Measures with an Emphasis on Physiotherapy Research and Clinical Practice. Our moderators are Dr. Surya Prakash and Dr. Arun Kumar. Uh, the webinar is hosted by IAP and IAPWC of Andhra Pradesh. The webinar is streaming live on our YouTube channel. I request all the participants and attendees to kindly like and subscribe for further updates. Now I request our moderators to start over with the session. Good evening, one and all. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker, Dr. Komal Krishna Tiwari, and her work. Ma'am has been has completed her MPT in musculoskeletal and sports medicine, physiotherapy, and she's working as a physiotherapy and chiropractic assistant in Winni Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. She has been a highly motivated, confident young professional with a master's degree in physical therapy, specialized in musculoskeletal sports and medicine from Raju Gandhi University of Health Sciences, India. She has been actively engaged in several cross-disciplinary research projects and is a young researcher in the field of physiotherapy, especially epidemiology and outcome research, outcomes research. Of now, she has authored around 12 papers that were published in reputed national and international journals. Besides, she had attended numerous conferences, seminars, workshops, and CMEs related to the field of physiotherapy. She is also a certified in obstructive respiratory disease and implications in regards to COVID-19 through the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. She has also been awarded Dr. Shri Shivaratri Rajendra Mahaswamiji Award for out outstanding academic performance in her master's by JSS College of Physiotherapy. Throughout her academic journey, she has received awards for her academic excellence, scientific work. Her research interest includes neuromuscular skeletal disorders, physiotherapeutics, geriatric care, patient-specific functional outcomes, evidence-based medicine, and various aspects of physiotherapy practice. Currently, she is working as a physiotherapist and chiropractic assistant and holds a two-year experience in Canada. And I just have a few, I would like to name a few of the researches which ma'am has gone through. Most of all, and the latest is preparedness and lessons learned from the novel coronavirus, which is published in the International Journal for Occupational Environmental Medicine 2020. Then we have Gillian Barry Syndrome and Orphan Disease World Journal of Pharmaceutical Research in 2017. Then we have Werewolf Syndrome and Orphan Genetic Disorder, International Journal of Pharm Pharma Research and Health Sciences in 2017, Asthma, COPD, Overlap Syndrome, and Undiagnosed an underdiagnosed clinical condition among geriatrics. Tired all the time, a chronic fatigue syndrome, a selfie syndrome, a disease of the new era, which is published in 2016, kangaroo mother care, a boon to low birth weight and preterm babies, fat wallet syndrome, a mini review, European Journal of Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences, 2016, Umbilical cord blood, the hidden treasure, Journal of Medical, Pharmaceutical and Allied Sciences, Beauty Parlor Syndrome, a modern threat to the feminine world, International Journal of Pharmaceutical and Medical Research in 2016. And I would like to invite ma'am to take over the session, please. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, ma'am. Um, I moved with a kind of humble invite. Uh, done by IEP and Women's Cell. I thank one and all for a wonderful uh, introduction. Thanks. Thank 
So whenever you would want me to share the slides, please let me know. Uh, Dr. Komal, you can start sharing your screen. You can Absolutely. share. So, hello everyone. Thank you so much for uh, making time to be able to attend the webinar session. And I would uh, like to thank IEP and Women's Cell firstly to begin with for giving me a wonderful opportunity to be able to say, uh, share my insights on uh, the amount of knowledge that I have with everyone possible. So to begin with, uh, without further ado, I would like to jump into the topic right away. So today uh, I would, I mean, would want to specify that it's a very uh, extensive topic which I just tried to simplify and be able to put uh, in front everybody. So the topic is about outcome measures and their importance in physical therapy uh, practice, clinical and research both. So by the end of this presentation, uh, we will all be able to outline the concepts of outcome measure, basically understand what an outcome is, what an outcome measure is, what are the various types of outcome measures, etc. And then we will uh, understand the psychometric properties and their importance in the uh, outcome measures and selection of outcome measure. Because honestly, when I was a student, it was always a challenge for me to understand or uh, to select an outcome measure in my clinical postings, especially because I always used to have a very generally any student will definitely have a very limited time and for that matter of fact even in our clinical practice we usually do not have a lot of time to be able to uh, look for or search for various outcome measures to be able to uh, apply them on our patients so i have come up with an idea to simplify the process of selection of the outcome measures so that it's easy for everyone, uh, including the uh, students especially, who uh, usually struggle to identify the outcome measures in uh, various clinical aspects. And then once we identify, like understand how to select the outcome measures, then we need to know where to access them from. So I made an attempt to come up with uh, a few resources that avail or uh, that provide us with various outcome measures. It's actually a treasure for all of us. Uh, and then we will also be able to uh, articulate the process of translation of an outcome measure, keeping in mind the cultural aspects. And finally, we will also look at the challenges and facilitators in regards to usage of outcome measures. So to begin with, because this is an, uh, what do you say, virtual meeting and the chance of interacting with the audience is very limited. I request you all to please uh, be, I mean, keep your mobile phones handy, or you can also have an extra tab in your uh, computers so that you can click this link on the address bar that is polev.com slash komalkrishna434. This will allow you to uh, interact with me because I'm going to throw, throw some uh, interesting questions in the presentation alongside. So uh, making this presentation not just a one-sided one, but an interactive one and an interesting, engaging one. So all you have to do is 
type polev.com slash Komal Krishna 434 on the address bar, but not the Google search bar where you type www something. So that is where you need to put in this particular link. Now, to start with, before we know what an outcome measure is, we need to understand what an outcome is. So the outcome is the effect of treatment or a program or some policies that we usually use on our patients or any particular population in terms of research. An outcome measure is the one that measures the outcome. So outcome measures are various types, such as I've mentioned a few of them, like scales, instruments, questionnaires, rating forms, or other tests. So these are used to look at the patient's current status. And there are various outcome measures that help us score the patient's uh, data or patient's uh, information, health information, and we can also interpret the results from the health information provided by our patients or uh, by the cl clinicians looking at the data of our patient. And at times it also provides the risk categorization of our patients. Usage of outcome measures prior to providing any intervention is very important. This helps us to get a, a baseline data but we need to remember that usage of the same outcome measure pre and post the intervention is important to get uh, accurate results. So we need to use them before uh, giving any intervention or a treatment plan or treatment th uh, therapy to our patients. And then we uh, continue giving the uh, treatment. And then at the end of the treatment, we use the same outcome measure to be able to evaluate the progress. And uh, while I was looking at the research, or uh, while I was looking at the literature, I ca came across a few articles that were talking about the uh, importance of usage of outcome measures in uh, physiotherapeutic and rehabilitation practice. So these are some articles that spoke about uh, the under usage of various outcome measures in physiotherapeutic practice, hence leaded or uh, gave me an insight to look for this presentation and be able to share with you all. Coming to the evidence-based practice perspective, right now, everything we do needs to be evidential. Therefore, usage of outcome measures gives us a lot of, uh, I mean, gives us a lot of help in providing more credible and reliable justifications in regards to the treatment or any outcome that we provide to our patient. And then outcome measures also help us to change our judgment from opinion-based to uh, evidence-based. I then came across a few more articles in regards to the ICF corsets. So when I was looking at these articles, there was a validation process done between various outcome measures and uh, the content of the outcome measures and the ICF corsets. So majority of the studies said that the content of the outcome measures is pretty much similar to the ICF corsets. However, we need to uh, look at more or more specific to the patient or corsets of ICF for the outcome measures to be more closely relatable to the patients. So now looking at the ICF model, outcome measures can definitely be identified based upon the ICF classification. And we can also use the ICF itself as an outcome measure for uh, being able to uh, assess the functional status of our patients or for being able to set goals and also planning treatment and monitoring our patients. It also further develops our uh, outcome measures, I mean, sorry, the treatment to be more patient-centric and we also uh, get an idea of the needs of the patient and accordingly provide the therapy. Now, here is the time for you all to, uh, all to interact with me. So all you have to do is when uh, in your address bar, you have to just click, uh, click polev.com, Komal Krishna Tiwari, uh, sorry, Komal Krishna 434, and you'll be able to see this question. The question is, could you please name any type of, of outcome measure that you have ever heard about? I'll probably give you guys five to 10 minutes. Patient, wonderful, patient reported outcome measures. That's perfect, bang on. Anything else? I'll probably give 10 more seconds. Looking forward for the responses.
clinician reported. Wonderful. That's great. I'm getting some responses. Awesome. Well, okay, we'll move on now. Okay, there's something else. Oh, wow, observer reported, awesome. Okay, now we'll move on to the actual classification of the outcome measures. So the outcome measures are basically divided into four types. They are self-reported outcome measure. We try, we'll try to focus on the words, the names of the outcome measure, where we'll be able to understand the outcome, I mean, the types of outcome measures very easily. So self-reported, just focus on the names of the uh, types for now. We'll discuss in detail in the future slides. So self-reported outcome measures, performance-based outcome measures, observer-reported outcome measures, and clinician-reported outcome measures. And fortunately, a lot of uh, responses that I received in the previous question had a few of these. So we'll start with the self-reported outcome measure. To be uh, precise and to, be, uh, to make this very simple, the name itself states that it is self-reported. Basically, the patient himself or herself can report their health information to the therapist or the clinician. And uh, these are basically more in the form of questionnaires and they provide us a perception of our patient. We can achieve or collect the data from our uh, patients in the form of interviews, or we can ask the patient or, uh, by themselves to fill in the forms or the questionnaires and provide them back to us. And these are typically fixed forms, such as they are in the form of papers, or we also have computerized or electronic based uh, questionnaires. So now coming to the patient reported outcome measures, these are one of the types or basically they are the subtypes of uh, self reported outcome measures, which are like the name actually itself suggests that's why I was telling in the beginning of classification to focus on the names of the outcome measures types because the names themselves clearly depict what the each type means. So patient reported outcome measure means that the patient himself or herself is giving us their information. So these can be disease specific or generic. They usually any patient reported or self reported outcome measure is uh, an outcome measure that gives us the data without our interference with the patient. Unless the patient is not uh, understanding the question, you can definitely explain them, but you're not going to interfere anywhere in regards to the outcome or the data that the patient is giving to us. Now moving on to the second type, this is the performance based outcome measure. So basically the name again, you need to focus on the names. So the performance based outcome measure itself says that this is something related to the performance of the patient. So we try to give some set activities to the patient and we uh, rate it against objective measures or qualitative measures such as time or giving them activities and looking if the activity is being performed normally or abnormally. And usually these uh, outcome measures give us the current status of the uh, patient and remember that these outcome measures do not have to be consistent. The results from these outcome measures do not have to be consistent because the performance of the uh, patient or the client or the participant can keep changing time to time. So today, if the patient is being, um, uh, for example, let's take six minutes walk test. So if it is today, the patient is giving us X number of uh, value in the interpretation, that, that doesn't mean that every time you do the six minute walk test, we need to get the same measurements. So this is typically not going to equate when you keep repeating it. And then the, uh, basically these are the ones that provide us physiological factors from the patient's uh, health status. And then we have observer reported outcome measures. Again, we need to focus on the name. So the name says it is observer reported. So simply understand with the name that the uh, outcomes uh, are provided or the outcome measure is provided, filled, the data is filled, the information is given by the observer. The observer can be either caregivers, bystanders, parents, or somebody who's been closely watching the patient. So in what conditions can we expect somebody to give us the information about the patient? In uh, situations where the patient is cognitively impaired or patient where they are not in an age or like, for example, pediatric population, 
who cannot give their information accurately sometimes in this kind of situation may depend upon the parents so i've given some examples here the pediatric quality of life inventory and the strengths and difficulties questionnaire in pediatric population so in the strengths and uh, difficulty questionnaire sometimes it is given to the uh, infants i mean the children population who are able to uh, pediatric population who's able to fill in their information accurately but in case if the child cannot give us the appropriate answers if the child is under age then we pass on the questionnaire to the parents to be able to achieve a, uh, appropriate information and then there uh, is another form of outcome measure that's the clinician reported outcome measure so again the name suggests and it is very simple to understand that we the clinicians the therapists or the healthcare professionals look at the data or information or the reports of our patient based upon our clinical judgments and the patient's behavior we come up with our observations and the assessment provides us the information about the patient now i throw another question to you guys so let's see how many of you know this euro call five dimension questionnaire is what type of an outcome so is it a patient reported outcome measure or it is a clinician reported outcome measure wow so far it looks like all of you think that it is a patient reported outcome measure looks like i'm doing a good job great so i'm going to give you five more seconds and let's see okay four three two one awesome not a problem so yeah the answer is it is a patient reported outcome measure because when we were talking about the self reported and patient reported outcome measure we said that these are typically the questionnaire forms and uh, the quality of life is usually taken from the patient so yeah definitely this is a patient reported outcome measure moving on another question time up and go test is an example of performance based outcome measure so is this statement a true statement false or we don't know let me give you 10 seconds i'm happy to see the response okay let's see if i get some more okay looks like people are responding in the chat to awesome that's good perfect so yeah that's absolutely true because when we were talking about performance based outcome measure we said that we measure the outcome against objective or quantifiable uh measurement that is time or normal or abnormal mechanics so this is absolutely a true statement perfect moving on okay yeah so going on we need to understand the psychometrics for the outcome measures of the outcome measures before we uh understand or before we try to use any outcome measure so what are the psychometrics the psychometrics are basically the internal attributes of an outcome measure so they are the uh, elements that contribute to the statistical adequacy basically the reliability the validity and other measurement errors and internal consistencies that the outcome measure uh, correlates with so let's look at the various types of psychometric properties so the psychometric properties are generally divided into four types so they can be validity reliability responsiveness and interpretability honestly speaking this is a whole uh, different cost uh, concept or a topic that we can uh, elaborately discuss about but because we need to understand the basic concept behind this before using or uh, understanding an outcome measure i just wanted to put a few slides uh, regarding this a few uh, little bit of information about this so that we can understand uh, in the further slides based upon what criteria can we select the outcome measures and what are the criteria to be reliable on these outcome measures so just to understand i am, i totally know that this is a very extensive topic whole new topic 
but to be aware of these uh, concepts i just came up with a uh, very brief uh, introduction to these psychometric properties in this presentation so now you might be wondering what this picture says so basically in the first situation where you see the black dots are the response in all the three uh, pictures so the black dots are the responses that we get from our patient and the red dot that you see in the middle is the uh, point that we actually want the patient to uh, give the information about so in the first situation you see that the results or the response is pretty scattered and is not straight to the uh, point so basically it's not consistent and it is not supposed to uh, i mean it is not giving us the information what it is supposed to give so this in this picture we can clearly say that this one is neither reliable nor valid in the second picture the responses are pretty consistent as you see that they are con uh, concise or uh, constrained to one particular uh, spot so these answers or these uh, responses are pretty uh, consistent but they are not straight to the point therefore we can say that this outcome measure is reliable but this is not valid and the final situation crystal clear by now that the responses are consistent as well as they are bang on to the point so this is a reliable and valid situation now moving on to validity it is defined as the degree to which an instrument measures the constructs it is intended to measure to simplify this i would say that validity is basically the concept or the property of an outcome measure to be able to measure what it is supposed to measure we'll understand in the future slides and then we have uh, a lot of types of outcome measures such as space validity content validity construct validity predictive validity and criterion validity out of all these criterion and predictive validity are usually very important so what is a criterion validity this is basically going to uh, give us the performance of the instrument against a gold standard that the uh, outcome measure should actually be measuring and predictive validity is one of the types of uh, cr uh, criterion validity where it predicts about the degree of performance or uh, the degree to which the test can predict in the future situations moving on to reliability reliability is the degree to which the tool is free from measurement errors to simplify this basically reliability is the level of consistency of the results or the outcome that an outcome measure provides so these are basically divided into three types test rate test reliability inter-rater reliability and internal consistency so we'll look at each type of the uh, reliability in detail to start with test rate test reliability again i would want you to focus on the names of the types of reliability so test rate test reliability is when you test the same participant multiple times minimum of two times and then look at the correspondence between the responses that the patient has provided each time so when you keep testing the same patient multiple times maybe twice or thrice and then you look at the response of the uh, patient uh, through the outcome measure and look at the uh, results that we uh, get from the outcome measure and try to correspond the res uh, results from each time and uh, usually a minimum of uh, 0.90 is the suggested uh, minimal test rate test reliability for us to say that this is a very good or excellently reliable outcome measure and then we have inter rater reliability again the name itself says it is between the raters inter rater so it is between two or more observers or two or more uh, raters or assessors who look at the same patient but in two different times generally 80% agreement between both the, both the two observers is said to be good inter rater reliability moving on to internal consistency this is most commonly used estimate of reliability for any outcome measure and it is the degree to which the items on the questionnaire or the uh, questions on the outcome measure associate with each other this is represented through 
Cranbach's alpha. Cranbach's alpha basically talks about the association between each item uh, on the questionnaire and their uh, association between each other. So usually it is said to be that uh, a value, a Cronbach's alpha value between 0 0.70 to 0 0.95 is considered to be acceptable, but anything below 0 0.7 is questionable. Moving on to responsiveness, it is pretty simple. Responsiveness is uh, the amount or the sensitivity of the outcome measure to change to be able to understand or to be able to assess change over time in the patient. And usually it is very sensitive to change and uh, we also co uh, commonly evaluate these responsiveness uh, criteria of an outcome measure through pro uh, cor correlation by using various scores such as sensitivity, specificity, etc. Finally, interpretability. It is the usability of the outcome measure rather than it being a, a, a psychometric property. And usually it, uh, it, it helps us to equate the qualitative meaning of the questionnaire with the quantitative one. And now there's a question. This is a very interesting question. Does validity imply reliability and vice versa? That means does validity imply reliability and reliability imply uh, validity? This is a very confusing question. I know that it uh, sounds very scary, but once I explain, I hope it should not be that scary. Okay, receiving some responses. Be false, okay, chat says false. Okay, anything else? Anybody else? Okay, I'll give five more seconds and then we'll uh, try to understand this concept. Okay, somebody says A, true. Okay, and then four, three, two, one. Thanks for your responses, guys. So let's look at the actual concept behind this confusing statement. So validity implies reliability and vice versa. The answer is false. That's absolutely, absolutely right. Because let's understand what's happening behind this confusing statement. So I say that validity implies reliability, but it doesn't uh, mean that reliable outcome measure has to be valid. So to simplify this statement, let me give you an example. So let's talk about an inclinometer where you're trying to measure a, sh a shoulder range of motion for an individual for flexion of shoulder or whatever range of motion you would want to. And you see that the inclinometer's needle is fluctuating beyond zero, beyond the neutral point. So it might be something around four degrees or five degrees, say for example. And then you keep measuring the shoulder range of motion again and again and again and again. You see that the shoulder range of motion of x degrees keeps repeating itself. That means the outcome measure is reliable because it's giving us the consistent outcome. But would you say that this outcome measure is valid? I doubt because the inclinometer's needle was not accurately pointing at zero or neutral. It was above zero. So this is not valid. Just because the inclinometer is reliable, it doesn't mean that it has to be valid. Now let, let us look at the other side of the coin. Say, for example, if the inclinometer is absolutely valid and it has the needle bang on zero and it gives us the uh, range of motion of the shoulder joint or whichever joint you guys are looking at, repeatedly, we get the same results consistently. Why do we get the same results consistently? Because the outcome measure or the inclinometer is perfectly valid. So this is a very uh, simple example that I came up with to explain this complicated statement. So if the inclinometer is valid, it will definitely be reliable. But if the inclinometer is reliable, it doesn't have to be valid. I tried to make this statement simple. If you still have any questions or confusions, throw them at me in the in, uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. Now, moving on. Okay, now we'll look at the selection criteria 
so these are some uh, actually this is a very difficult situation for a lot of uh, physical and rehab therapists because at times it is difficult for us to understand or to be able to judge what outcome measure can we select in uh, various clinical or research situations so to simplify the selection criteria i've come up with a few questions to keep in mind while selecting uh, an outcome measure which makes our work pretty easy so moving on we'll look at the questions in detail so the very important question you need to keep in your mind is why are we using the outcome measure so what is the reason behind using the outcome measure are we trying to look at the impact of disorder on the individual or are we trying to establish a baseline measure or do we want to monitor the changes by you know uh, assessing the individual before giving any therapy and then after giving a therapy do you want to look at the impact of the therapy that you have provided or are you looking at specific needs of the patient that you would want to uh, achieve at the end of your session the second important question is what are you looking at what are you trying to measure what do you want to measure so are we looking at impairments in body structure and function or activity limitations or participation restrictions for the individual or the quality of life of the uh, patient and do we want to structure our, uh, our our intervention in and around that particular concept so these are some factors that you also need to focus on and then we have another question for ourselves how do we want to use the outcome measure so are we trying to uh, establish a contact a face to face contact with the patient or are we uh, is the patient comfortable and we are comfortable sending the outcome measure to the patient through email or sending them by mail or in post or whichever form possible or do you actually need the patient to be in front of you and then we have some uh, situations where we need very sensitive information from our patients in such kind of situations there are uh, confidential laws or confidentiality methods that you need to keep in mind and you have to look at uh, a process where you can achieve or you can get the information from the patient with a smooth and with more consent oriented pattern and then we have another question for us is that do we need any specific uh, training while using the outcome measure do we have to look at uh, practicing it before we use or do we have to learn anything before we implement the outcome measure in our clinical practice and there's one more question very important question for us uh, in indian scenario is the language appropriate for the patient is it appropriate for the patient to understand if not we'll look at those uh, concepts and then the psychometrics of our outcome measures so very important uh, psychometrics rate of error minimal detectable change minimally clinically important difference and the validity we need to focus on all these factors to look at the uh, psychometrics of the outcome measures if they are uh, reliable and if they are valid to be used in that particular uh, situation so rate of error it is pretty simple to understand rate of error is indirectly proportional to reliability so basically if rate of error is high uh, rate of error is high reliability falls down so that outcome measure is not reliable going on minimal detectable change this is the change that is achieved uh, from the baseline data or baseline uh, information of our patient and that data for example if the patient comes with a vas of 7 and is uh, having a terrible pain in shoulder joint and uh, in the initial or in the baseline data we get a vas of 7 so on day 3 if the patient gives us the uh, vas of maybe 6 that is called minimal detectable change so you see that very minimally there is a change in the patient's pain now looking at the minimal clinically important difference this is something which is clinically important for example the vas of 7 by the end of day 5 is something around 5 
So you would say this is something clinically important, but this is very minimal. So based upon this change, you cannot stop your therapy and you need to look at uh, focusing on your goals to be able to get the VAS of uh, five to zero. And you keep continuing your uh, therapy till the end of uh, your uh, set goals and be able to achieve that particular goal. Finally, validity, we have spoken enough about it. So validity basically is the uh, outcome measure accurately measuring what it is supposed to measure and giving us the information what it is supposed to give. Moving on financial consideration, this is one important uh, thing that needs to be considered. So is the outcome measure free of cost or do we have to pay anything to be able to use it? And then do we have to uh, attain any licensure during uh, usage of the outcome measure or do we need any extra uh, equipment during performing that particular test or during performing that particular outcome measure usage. And then therapist implementation, this is very important for us as therapists to understand if the outcome measure is easy to use because if it is complicated, you need to spend a lot of time on it, learning it, and then maybe it takes a lot of our time during the assessment, which is not really a good practice. And then we have we have to look at if we need any special training and if so we need to use it practice it before using it on the patient and then we also need to look if there are standardized instru instructions provided with the outcome measure because if it does not then it, uh, it would be greek and latin to use on our patients and then two more important topics last but not least time and patient so time how long does it take for us to carry out the measure or the outcome measure or the test on our patient and how long does it take for us to get the results from the outcomes measure and one important thing that we need to consider is patient's comfort if the patient is comfortable providing us their information if they are okay with the amount of time that the outcome measure takes so on and so forth now finally Looking at the resources, now that you know uh, how to select an outcome measure, now you there's something more important than that. You know how to select the outcome measure. But if you don't know where to avail the outcome measure from, what would you do? So these are some databases, sorry, the resources where you can uh, avail the outcome measures from. For example, rehab measures, uh, Physiopedia, this is rehab measures uh, data, uh, database. The website actually more or less looks like this. And then this is the Regis University data uh, resource that you can definitely use for availing various outcome measures. And it's very simple to use. You will have it, uh, I mean, in, in the rehab measures, there's a search bar. You can look for your particular uh, outcome measure and you can download the version if it is freely available. If you don't know what outcome measure to be used, you can look for the filters that are provided in the uh, website and it's pretty simple to look for any outcome measure. So by the end of this presentation, if uh, anybody has a question in their head that um, what outcome measure would I be using in uh, this kind of a situation or this kind of uh, patient condition. So it's pretty simple. You just have to go to any of these databases and look for that particular condition and you will be able to see that uh, outcome measure or actually you will be able to see a lot of outcome measures for that particular condition. All you have to do is understand the uh, reliability, validity or the psychometric properties and look for the uh, scenario where it is properly uh, applicable to and be able to look and uh, select the outcome measure from there. So now a very important uh, concept in regards to the outcome measure, especially pertaining to Indian scenario, that is cultural aspect. I'm proud to say that India is a diverse country with a lot of cross-culture uh, scenarios going on. And uh, in this kind of a situation, it is difficult for uh, our population to understand a monotonous outcome measure. For example, an outcome measure that is in English it doesn't have to be understood by all the population of the country because a lot of our uh, people or a lot of our public is not as educated to understand the uh, English versions of the outcome measure. 
but why do we have to adapt an outcome measure into another language when it is already uh, available in universally accepted language there are two main reasons why we need to adapt the uh, outcome measure into different or another cultural concept or a cultural pattern so number one health or illness is always different has different meanings in different languages therefore in different countries different states especially in india even if you uh, cross one prob uh, probably one city to the other things change drastically so it is very important to understand what culturally uh, fits into that particular population and the second important concept that we need to look at for translating or uh, adapting a, uh, an outcome measure into another cultural uh, aspect is because outcome measures have become standardized tools in the era of evidential uh, research or evidence based practice it is important for us to use outcome measures to get more objective and more uh, evidential outcomes now i have another question to you guys so translation is done to identify the gaps between the original and translated version of an outcome you guys can start voting now and i'm going to look at the chat responses so yeah somebody says it is true let's see what the other participants want to say okay that's good anything else i'm going to give you 5 more seconds and let's move on okay true okay now the answers are split between true and false okay anybody else okay somebody says in chat it is true and anything else last 3 seconds more 3 2 1 awesome thanks for your responses guys i appreciate all your efforts so let's see majority of our participants say that this statement is true and a uh, minority of the population says that this can be a false statement never mind so i will try to explain it in simpler form so this statement says that the translation process is done to identify the gaps basically gaps means the difference between the original and translated version the difference in terms of uh, being applicable to the uh target population or the population that we would want to get the uh data of so basically this is a true statement to keep it short because we are looking at translating or adapting the outcome measure into another language to look at the difference that the source language for example maybe english to hindi or english to any other kannada telugu whatever language so english is the source language and the other language that we would want the outcome measure to be in would be the target language so in english some words might not similarly uh, mean as they might mean in the local language in any other local language for that matter so basically this is the process where we look at extensively understanding the word to word meaning and the content of the questionnaire or the outcome measure and making sure that this can be applied to the target population so not to worry we'll look at detailed process of translation in the next future slides so you will be able to understand it in detail so let's look at the steps that are involved in the outcome measure i tried to simplify these uh stages into five uh, stages so basically the first step would be the initial translation where uh just so you know these terminologies are going to be frequently used in further slides so i'm going to uh, name them clearly so that you remember so ta is translation a tb is translation b and in stage 1 there are two translations that are achieved from source language to target language i would like to give an example saying that outcome measure in english is the source language and outcome measure in hindi would be the uh, target language so in the stage 1 initial translation we have 
two translated versions of the english language into hindi language so two hindi translated outcome uh, outcome measures so basically if anything is confusing kindly uh, let me know at the end of the session i would be more than happy to explain things again and then the second stage is synthesis of the translation so synthesis basically synthesizing the first two versions that is translation a and b of hindi into one translation that is translation a and b hindi now stage 3 is back translation so from this target language that is hindi to source language that is english so again we have two translations here bta back translation a and btb back translation b the fourth stage would be the expert committee this is very important for any outcome measure uh, translation so basically this is the crucial stage where a committee of five to six uh, people depending upon the translators uh, it they sit together discuss about each stage or each translated version along with the original one that is the english version in this scenario and they figure out they come up with uh, a lot of consensus and then they discuss and figure out what the meanings of uh, different words in uh, both the languages uh, mean and then they conclude with a final pretest version or pre final version of the questionnaire in the target language in this scenario it is the hindi language so the final stage would be testing the final uh, pre final version because this is still not final because we haven't looked at the reliability and validity of that translated outcome measure into hindi so this is still not final version of the outcome measure this is the pre final version of the outcome measure therefore the final stage is where the outcome measure is tested for its psychometric properties so now stage 1 is the initial translation which is also called as forward translation and as i said there is minimal requirement of two versions of the translation forward translation from english to hindi minimally recommended and then in this stage basically we are trying to compare the outcome measure from hindi i mean from english the source language to the hindi we're trying to look at the uh, differences the discrepancies that we see while we are uh, translating it and we look at what the uh, words actually mean do we need to change them uh, is there any gap between the two uh, versions and basically in this step we have two translators so translator a and translator b so translator a is the person who is aware of the situation or the concept behind translating the outcome measure this is done to be able to get more cl clinically and measurement uh, me measurementally accurate uh, information while we are translating the outcome measure and translator b is completely opposite so this person is neither aware nor informed about the uh, concept or the situation or the need for translating the outcome measure into another language we also make i mean we also try to look at uh, the person being out of our medical or clinical field so this kind of translation is known as night translation which is free from any kind of bias or any kind of influence so this is basically done to be able to identify various meanings of various words and if the words are actually uh, intended or are they reflecting the meaning that the target population actually uses now stage 2 is the synthesis of the translation where as uh, mentioned earlier it is simply synthesizing of translation a and translation b in stage 1 to translation ab that is one single hindi version translation by colla collaborating or by combining the translation a and translation b achieved in stage 1 and making sure that each step not just uh, step 2 but whereas step 1 2 3 4 each and every stage needs to have its own written report regarding what has happened what did we do why did we do and each thing that is explained in detail and it is important to reach consensus instead of fighting or instead of compromising and back translation is the process where the hindi version is now translated back to english 
So basically, in stage two, we achieved the synthesis of combined uh, Hindi translated version from translated A version to translated B version, and we move uh, and we synthesize or we get one uh, version of Hindi translated outcome measure. So this is named translation A B. Now in stage three, there's a person who is going to translate uh, this Hindi translated T A B. into source language that is english there are some uh, points that need to be uh, considered in this stage stage that this is one type of validity checking but this is not the ultimate validity checking this is only the content validity that is being checked and in this process again we need two uh, translations bta back translation a and btb back translation b so we make sure that the people who are translating the hindi version back to english are completely unaware of whatever is happening and they are not at all informed about anything that uh, is going behind the translation process and we also make sure that they are not from medical background and very important thing that they need to have the source language that is the uh, english as their mother tongue now fourth stage is the expert committee stage as i mentioned that this is very crucial and important stage of uh, cross cultural adaptation process and it consists of methodologists or the researchers health professionals who usually are going to use or who usually use the outcome measure language professionals and all the translators that is in step 1 forward translate translation there were two translators and then there uh, in back translation uh, there were two translators who translated the hindi version back to english so basically this committee consists of all these people and what is the role of this committee why do we need this uh, committee this committee is very important to look at uh, the various concepts or various wordings various content uh, issues in the original outcome measure to the translated version to see if they need to make any changes do they need to discuss on some points in the outcome measure so basically they work together to reach consensus to be able to provide us a pre final version of the outcome measure so now they look at four uh, basic concepts or four basic areas to be able to understand different meanings or different uh, wordings in the outcome measure and to be able to replace them i'll put them very simple to you guys so these are the uh, semantic uh, equivalence idiomic equivalence experiential equivalence and conceptual equivalence so semantic equivalence means if the meaning of the word is uh, different from what actually it has to be or does it sound uh, similar to something else does it have multiple meanings or does it not uh, sound grammatically correct is there any issue with it so they look at these kind of concepts in regards to the meaning of the uh, word and then idiomic equivalence we all know that uh, india or basically any language for that matter has their own idioms and that idiom when translated doesn't have its own uh, meaning or its own punch so that uh, idioms are difficult at times to be translated so in these kind of situations the committee sits together and understands the meaning of the idioms and tries to uh, maybe replace it with more relevant culturally relevant idioms in the outcome measure and experiential uh, equivalence is one important thing to understand because experience of daily living are different in different population for that matter so for example cross country skiing doesn't actually happen in our country very often so it is not very relevant to our population so this committee sits together and looks at what can uh, what could be the similar activity that our population might be performing and then they look at uh, certain activities or certain uh, daily living uh, experiences that the patient population goes through and tries to Uh, discuss and reach a consensus to be able to achieve that, uh, or be able to change or replace that particular word or that particular activity. And finally, conceptual meaning to see if the words have different concepts between various uh, cultures. 
And step five, the last stage of uh, the translation process, this is the pre-test version. In this test, we basically uh, do a pilot testing. In this stage, we basically do a pilot testing on about a minimum uh, target population of 30 members. And we see for various reliability, uh, validity concepts, if they if the outcome measure, the translated version is having a good validity, reliability. And uh, basically this only addresses the content validity and does not address the construct validity or reliability. Therefore, it is highly recommended that other psychometric properties of the translated version should also be uh, tested. Now let's summarize in a nutshell the entire process of translation. I am going to revise it. And even after this, if you have any questions, please throw at uh, me at the end of the session. So in the beginning, we have the original outcome measure that is in English. In step one, the English outcome measure is translated to Hindi twice by two people. One person who's aware about what's happening behind the translation process, are we doing it uh, to be using it for our research or clinical practice or whatever it may be. And the other person is completely unaware of whatever uh, is going on with the translation process. In step two, both the Hindi translation uh, versions are synthesized into translation Hindi version TAB. And in step three, the Hindi version is back translated into English. So from uh, Hindi, it goes back to English by the person who, I mean, by the people, both the people who have their mother tongue as the source language, that is English. So they translate into English BTA1 or BTAA and BTB. So basically two translations back to English. And the fourth stage is the committee where they sit together with all the written reports provided uh, by the translators or by the researchers from stage one to stage three. So original uh, questionnaire, translated questionnaire in forward translation to Hindi A, translated version B, and the synthesized translation ver version TAB, Hindi, and the back translated version BTA, that is one translation and the BTB, the other translation back to English. All these translated versions, original outcome measure and the written reports of each stage are together discussed by the committee based upon various factors. They look at what are the, uh, what is the need for replacing the words. Accordingly, they replace the words, they change the uh, words if needed and they synthesize a pre-final version of the outcome measure, which is tested in stage five on a pilot uh, population of at least 30 members. I hope the process is clear. If not, I can definitely explain if needed. Now, coming to the barriers, there are various barriers for uh, usage of outcome measures in our clinical and research practice. Therefore, we need to understand and we need to overcome these barriers to be able to uh, frequently use outcome measures in our practice. So what are those ba barriers? Let's look at them one by one. So time constraints, especially in busy setups, busy clinics, sometimes when we don't have enough time. So in this situation, how could we overcome it? There's a very simple process which can be followed so while the patient books an appointment with us, we can uh, ask them chief complaints uh, on call if, if possible. If not, at least be able to send them the assessment forms, like the basic uh, demographic data or the pain scale or you know the, the, the basic assessment form which asks for body chart and all these kinds of uh, information in the first or initial assessment uh, format which saves a lot of time before, even before the patient reaches the clinic, he is already up with the information uh, in the assessment format that we would want uh, while the patient is uh, doing any other uh, outcome measure or performing any other outcome measure. For example, if the patient has shoulder pain and you would want to give him dash, 
So the patient is already up with the assessment form. So you can have a look at the assessment form. And in the meantime, you can give the dash questionnaire to the patient and the patient can fill in the information or the questionnaire. And in the meantime, you're already ready with the uh, gist of the uh, patient's physical, uh, what do you say, physical performance or physical appearance by then. So you know what is going on with the patient based upon the initial assessment format. And then you have already invested time while the patient is doing or filling the outcome measure. So this is how you can come uh, outcome coming up. You can uh, reach to a solution for time constraints. And then we also have an issue Maybe when I was a student, I didn't know where to avail uh, the outcome measures. Even if I knew there were some outcome measures that were paid. So this is one uh, problem that many of us face that there are some outcome measures that are not paid. But coming to the unavailability, now we all must be aware where to avail the outcome measures from. And language barrier, which we by now know at the end of this presentation, we all know that how to overcome the language barrier now. And then patient understanding, we need to spend a bit of time with the patient to be able to uh, explain the process or explain the outcome measure to them. And length, luckily there are a lot of short uh, forms available, which we'll discuss in the facilitating uh, facilitators for the usage of outcome measure. So there are a lot of uh, short forms available to limit the length of the questionnaires. And then the relevance to the culture, which we already discussed about. And if there is problem with the uh, relevance of the uh, outcome measure to our target population, to our culture, we can definitely adapt the outcome measure into whatever cultural format we need. And one important concept or one important reason, reason or one important barrier in our uh, society would be low or no education level of our patients. So in this case, we might need a translator or we might need somebody, for example, maybe observer who would help us get the information from the patient. And then last but not the least, lack of knowledge amongst the clinicians. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, that will also be overcome. And then facilitators. Availability of short versions that I just said. So we have a lot of short forms of the outcome measures that can be used that uh, provide us uh, ease to use and uh, save a lot of our time. Then availability in translated versions. For example, we were talking about the Eurocall. It's actually a paid version. Uh, it's actually a paid outcome measure. That is its uh, barrier or uh, that is its limitation. But what is the facilitator? It is available in 200 different languages. So that is one thing that is very uh, good about it. And then free or accessible uh, availability of outcomes, outcome measures. So there are a lot of outcome measures in the database that I just uh, shared with you, the resources, uh, maybe rehab uh, measures or physiopedia for that matter, or Regis University's uh, database. You can definitely go and look for the uh, outcome measures that are available free of cost. There is a filter also available in rehab measures that says cost free or uh, paid. So you can also look for those kind of outcome measures. And then uh, these outcome measures or some outcome measures are very clearly explained and makes it very easy for the uh, clinicians or for us to use. And then just now I said that there are various resources. Now we know where to go and avail the outcome measures from. Educating students and therapists is one big facilitator for the usage or implementation of various outcome measures in clinical and research practice. So the students from the beginning should be encouraged to use various forms of outcome measures in uh, assessing the patient and being able to plan their goals and treatment plans or intervention planning based upon those outcome measures outcomes and outcome measures being handy or available in the clinical setups is one very important clinical uh, practice goal standard which needs to be followed so to be able to frequently use the outcome measures in our clinical practice, it is very important for us to understand that they need to be available in the clinic 
for us to use them. So as a clinical uh, therapist or a physiotherapist who owns the clinic, definitely we understand the population who comes to our clinic. So we, uh, as time passes, we read or we study the uh, type of conditions or type of, uh, uh, sorry, types of issues or complaints the patients come up uh, with to us. So for example, if the uh, clinic is in a, uh, in a center where there are more female population coming to the clinic with more shoulder uh, pain, so you need to be aware. So this is all uh, customized. You need to know about your own clinic or your own setup, and you need to understand what outcome measures would you uh, want to use for these kind of uh, complaints. For example, if you want dash available every time in your clinic, so you print them in a bulk, maybe 50 copies or 70 copies and put them available uh, in your front desk and then be able to give them when they are uh, in the clinic waiting in the waiting area or maybe the low back pain questionnaire or whatever, whatever for that matter, whatever you uh, see frequently coming to your clinic, you need to make sure that those outcome measures assessing these kind of patients are always available in the clinic. Maybe you can also have them in uh, e-format and instantly you can print them or whatever is comfortable for you. If you would want to send it to the uh, patient, you can email it to them, maybe send it um, in uh, mail or by posting or whatever way possible. But making sure that the availability of the outcome measures in the clinic is always there so that we get more objective and evidential results through which the patient also feels uh, motivated and feels confident that we are giving them the achievable and targeted goal, I mean goals uh, targeted in the beginning of our sessions. Now I would like to conclude with a few take home messages where I would uh, want to say that the outcome measures should be considered as crucial components in physical therapy practice because they are important in direct management of any individual patient because they give us a concept to understand the needs of the patient and we therefore focus on them instead of uh, you know, focusing on something that is, for example, maybe bio, biomechanical uh, factors, definitely. I wouldn't say that we shouldn't, but it's more important to focus on the patient-oriented goals. And then usage of these outcome measures is foster to improve the adaptation of good clinical practices and further improves patient-centric goal or care. So we definitely should make a, a, a habit of adapting the usage of outcome measures in our day-to-day -day practice, which is the thumb rule for good clinical practices. And this also allows us to uh, give more patient-centric care in our day-to-day -day practice. And last but not the least, usage of outcome measures should also be incorporated to achieve more evidence-based results and objective outcomes, as I just mentioned. So the patient also feels comfortable and confident that, you know, for example, if you uh, see the uh, VAS, just the basic one, and the patient on day one says seven, and on day 10 says three, he knows that we have done something to reduce their pain. So it gives them more confidence and makes them uh, more comfortable, and this way, it helps in enhancing the psychological fear uh, avoidance in the patients in regards to any ailment or any, for that matter, even a lot of patients are scared of being uh, treated, not, not just physiotherapy, but for that matter, there are a lot of people who are scared of uh, injections. So just to say, it's not about physiotherapy and people being scared of physiotherapy. It is just the psychological uh, process that is ongoing in a patient's brain while they uh, face both mental and physical pain at times. These are certain uh, objective measures to relieve them from such pain and show them the evidence that we are helping them. So basically outcome measures help us achieve our goals in uh, this direction. 
and I conclude my presentation here and I would be more than happy to answer any questions or if you want me to re-explain anything. So you can definitely bring it on to me. And uh, I would also want to take the uh, opportunity to thank IEP and Women's Cell for providing me this opportunity. And if anybody is interested, can definitely contact me in regards to collaborations and various research. And if they need any help from me in understanding the outcome measures and uh, cross-cultural adaptations in detail, I'd be more than ha happy to help them. Thank you one and all for your patient listening. Thank you, Komal ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I would like uh, to thank on behalf of IAP technical team, um, uh, Dr. Uh, vote of thanks to Dr. Sanjeev Jha, Dr. Ruchi Varshini, um, and uh, Komal ma'am, it was really nice, a very informative session. Uh, and um, I'm sure there would be people who would connect back to you for their uh, queries and doubts. Um, and uh, so we shall conclude the session for today. Um, uh, for the ones who have not uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel, kindly do that. Uh, it is IAP India, um, IAP India, the YouTube link. Uh, kindly like and subscribe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. You're very welcome. And do I have any questions? I was just wondering if anybody wants me to repeat anything. So far, we have uh, not come across any questions, but I'm sure they would get back to you. So. Absolutely. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you, one and all, especially uh, Kishore, sir, and uh, Kamala, ma'am, for uh, being able to collaborate with me all these days for making this happen. And thank you, one and all, uh, Arun sir, Surya sir, and uh, one and all, especially ma'am you for being able to uh, coordinate the event. Thank and uh, thanks everybody for listening to me patiently. And I hope you all stay safe and uh, stay well. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is Dr. Bhavna on behalf of IAP technical team signing out. Thank you very much, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.